If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I'm excited today. We've got Kenny from Strat in here. And I must tell you, it took us 40 minutes to, to get even started. We had some problems with the Internet, you know how it goes. But Kenny, you're most welcome here. Thank you for being here. You're a flight engineer. You serve with a SAF. Everybody speaks about you. And I must also say, yeah, you've got a magnificent beard. I think it's the best one we've ever had on the show. But now I'm going to ask you, where do you come from? How did you end up in the SAF? Uh, were your parents perhaps in the military? Well, as a lighty, I always used to build these model aircraft, and that kept me interested in flying and what have you. So my whole ambition was to join the Air Force at a later stage in life after I left school. I was never called up for the Army. So I joined the Air Force in January 1966 as a fitter aircraft. I did my apprenticeship on Sabres, Vampires and Impala. And the day I qualified, I was posted to helicopters to Puma Squadron, 19 Squadron. The two Pumas were still overseas coming from France. So in the meantime, waiting for them to come from France, I was working on freelance just to get a bit of chopper experience. And um, when the first two Pumas came into the country, I was tasked to go and help do the fit the aircraft work on them and the servicings and stuff. And I was there from 70 till 73. And I thought, oh, these guys are doing all these nice flights and everything like that. And all I'm doing is staying by the hangar and just working on the helicopters when they get back. So I thought, now it's time to become a flight engineer as well. And that's when I did the course. So I was posted to 17 Squadron to get a bit of background on helicopter, on the LOHs and stuff. And then I was sent to Oyster Plot to do the flight engineers course. That was in January 1973. I did the course there and after the course came back and then I was tasked to go to the bush. So I went to the bush, Rundu and Dongwa, served three months at Vintuk, did a nice trip at Vintuk because we flew to Sosas Fly with the diamond people, the police. And we went right up the coast to Springbok and then all the way back again. And on the way down, we stopped at this town that was all deserted and everything. And the major that was from the police, he took a net and he filled it up with crayfish, uh, old sardines and thing and threw it into the sea. And he pulled out all these crayfish. <laughs> and we had all these crayfish on the back of the Alouette seat in baskets. <clears throat> Flew back to Vintuk uh, and the Pumas used to land at Eros to refuel on their way to Ndongwa or Rindu for their changeover to fetch the other Pumas. Then I used to invite the crew in, hey, don't you want to come in for some crayfish? And they couldn't believe their ears. <laughs> yeah, so that was one of the nice things of the Vintuk trip. And then I was also seconded to the Rhodesian Air Force, as, oh, the SAP, sorry, and then later on to the Rhodesian Air Force when we were up in Rhodesia fighting that war. And in the beginning, when I went to first trip to Rinda, we were seconded to the Portuguese airfield, uh, Air Force in Angola fighting against UNITA. And after that, we would come back. And um, the other trips all over the place and Dacha Ops and all that was just nice and nice type of flying and everything. And then I was asked to go on the Alpha project at CSR. So I was seconded to CSR for four years doing the Alpha project, which is an alouette with a tandem cockpit, which we made out of glass fiber fitted to the alouette um, frame, the transmission frame. And that we took to Danal in 1983 to do test flights and that over there. And after that, in between, I also used to do all my bush trips and everything like that. And then um, a couple of years later, I was trans 
third to Donnell, seconded to Donnell on the Roy Falk project. And I was on the Roy Falk project and pulled the production line. Then they made me inspector. And then in 2002, I left the Air Force and I went to Paramount, well, ATE at that stage, to work on the MI-24. I used to go to Algeria and do all their servicings and stuff on the MI-24 in Algeria Air Force. And we also installed our weapon system from ATE into the MI-24s. <clears throat> and then later on, the Azerbaijan Air Force asked us to come and do their MI-24s with their weapon system, our weapon system onto their MI-24s. <clears throat> and that's how my career went, up and down, up and down. And now I'm at Warbirds at Wannabum. I'm rebuilding old helicopters and that Alouette threes, Alouette twos, and gazelles. And that's where I am today. Well, I find this very fascinating, but I want to... There were no Air Force people in your family. You were not like your dad's a pilot or something. You just got a love for his models and then yeah. started building them. Yeah. No, my dad, nobody was in the Air Force. <clears throat> my dad was in the Army in Italy in the First World War, but after that, he was a fitter and turner. So he just worked on the sawmill in Kwambanombi. And then later on, my wife also joined the Air Force. So we were both in the Air Force. She was admin clerk, and I was a flight engineer. <clears throat> and so we... Spent many years in the Air Force together. Yes, I'll put a picture of you two here. You were kind enough to give me one lovely couple, I have to say. But I'm very glad that you were with a, um, with a SAP and then to Rhodesia because no one has ever told us about that. How did that come along? Were you told, uh, look, you're going to join the SAP, sort of get the camo uniform and then you're going to go fight in Rhodesia. Yeah, that's what they did at the squadron. They seconded us to the SAP, and that's how we flew in Rhodesia as SAP. And then afterwards, we they, the police were withdrawn out of Rhodesia, and then we were sent to the Rhodesian Air Force, seconded to the Rhodesian Air Force. So I served a couple of, used to do nine months of a year, two up there. And that was quite a while. Till they got the independence and then we were pulled out. <clears throat> so how was that? I mean, is it a different culture? Totally a different lifestyle. You stayed in tents and had the most fantastic meals that you could ever think of. Those are decent cooks. They could cook food and they used to buy the food from town. So it wasn't supplied by the Air Force and that the cook used to go in and buy his own groceries and stuff. So he used to get these nice big steaks, egg and chips, and all that sort of meals regularly, even out in the bush and that. Yeah, I was lucky when I went to Rhodesia. Every time I went up, I was at a different camp. So Kariba, Kanyemba, um, Big Falls. Uh, it was nice. I went all over the place. Was that your wife who... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good yeah. to see the love after all these years. Yeah, but it's our anniversary today, so she no, wants to go is. out for supper. <laughs> yeah, not, it's not necessary. Hi. Hello. It's only, it's only 54 bloody years. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I'm so glad to hear that. Hi. It <laughs> impulse as well, I understand. I said you were in the Air Force as well. Yeah, yes, I was. Wow, and you okay, married 54 in... years. Yes, this is a <laughs> effing lifetime. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. Our... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, I promise I won't keep him too long. He's got to pay for that supper. <laughs> 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 That's fantastic to me to find people, you know, often in the military. We've been married. Okay. So many, many decades, so many years. There must be something special about you people. Why do you think you've been married so long? I mean, is it just 
So I would say distance makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> I suppose been away so many times and it's such a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that, you know, because you yeah. people were deployed all the time in the Air Force. Yeah. Was it everyone in the Air Force actually being deployed like that or was it just the flight crew and mechanics? Mostly the flying crew, yeah. Yeah, okay, so to get to get back to Rhodesia, I'm, I'm quite fascinated by this because this was like top secret. Nobody really knew uh, that the Air Force was there. That's why you were disguised as the South African police members. Yeah. Well, they were using the Air Force helicopters, so that's why we had to support them and service them. And and you and the pilot, you get transferred to like a place like Kanema. It's just you and the pilot and you're doing trooping and all that. So you've got to keep the aircraft serviceable and <clears throat> keep the weapon system clean and all that. So, and you used to do a lot of trooping, seven hours a day flying. It was quite a task sometimes, depending on what ops are had in Indonesia. <clears throat> So would you be flying Rhodesian Army, South Africans, uh, anybody, everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, SAS, Slew Scouts, uh, everybody we used to fly around. You had to have top secret clearance to fly the Slew Scouts and that around. So <clears throat> before you were allowed to fly them around. So, so tell me, what would be... Uh... They would be wearing their own uniforms, I suppose. But you're wearing your uniform, the police one. No, well, we flew with short green shirts and green and fellies. That's how we used to fly around. We didn't have camo uh, um, flying overalls and all that. We used to just fly. And otherwise, you just wore the Rhodesian camo and short pants and fellies. That's, that's the way we flew around there. <clears throat> But you had at that time also the 20 molds, or did you add the 303 guns? Yeah, the 303 and the 20 mold. It just depends on who you relieved when you went up to whatever aircraft you took over. If it had a 20 mold, then you'd fly with a 20 mold. If it had the 303, then you'd fly with a 303. <clears throat> but that 303, if I understand correctly, had four barrels. No, no, we just had the single barrel. And then later on, the four barrel one came out, the Dalmatian. Yeah, that only came out much later. But in the beginning of the war and what have you, it was just a single barrel 303, which they could, used to call the G car. And the 20 mil was the K car. The 20 mil always used to give top cover for the G cars dropping off the troops on the ground and that. But it seems to me, if I remember correctly, that all the air forces involved here used the same alouette free. It was the Portuguese, Rhodesians, and South Africans. Now, the Portuguese were just in Angola. They weren't in Rhodesia. You know, they were only in Angola fighting against UNITA, which we eventually were fighting with, <laughs> with Savimbi. I used to fly Savimbi around quite a lot in the, in the late days. But before that, we, we used to fight against them with the Portuguese. But then we used to just wear the Portuguese camera. So it would be the same tactics. Yes. Same tactics all over. Yeah. Also the 20 mil giving you top cover for the G cars going in and all that sort of stuff. Now we hear a lot of horrible things actually getting about the Portuguese army in, in Angola. Um, and of course, we as South Africans, we look at it from what happened after 1975, 74, in that period. But you, how would you rate the Portuguese army while they were still there and actually fighting? Well, they were excellent people because they, they like our people used to do a nine months army training. They were called up for three years. So they were up there for three years before they even went home again. And but they were good fighting soldiers. They were, <clears throat> and a lot of people say about the rape and all that. That's a lot of bulldust. That was wasn't from the Portuguese army. That was from I don't know who, but it wasn't from them. No, they weren't that type of people. 
So between all of them were the Rhodesians, the Portuguese, and I suppose the South Africans, who would be the easiest to work with on the ground forces with the troops? Well, they're all the same. They all trained the same way and everything like that. I wouldn't say there's any difference between Rhodesian, Portuguese, and South African troops. They all had discipline and were all, you know, fighting men and that. <clears throat> the Rhodesian war was a different way because they didn't have the Pumas to fly like 12 troops. They were flying four troops at a time, which was, you know, that's all the Alouette could take. And to <clears throat> drop them off in a contact area, you'd have like, say, four or five allies dropping 12 people off to do a fight. You know, it's, they were dedicated to the what they were caused to do. They definitely. And then 3-2 Battalion were also totally magnificent soldiers and the Rekis. They were absolute spot on to work with in that. <clears throat> yeah, and it was great to them. Have you ever felt that um, some kind of hostility against you because your Air Force from any unit, from uh, police or from uh, Army or Navy or whoever? Personally, never. Not once. Never, ever. No, we used to get on with the parabats and on Dongo, we used to drink together in the bar and everything like that. And uh, there was never any animosity or anything like that against us. Not a, not personally against me, never. What happens on a mission? I'm trying to figure this out. And perhaps we can, you can describe to me a typical how it works. If you be on the on the response team, how can I call it? You're waiting somewhere, and now the call out comes. The sirens go off. Um, what happens? Okay, I'll take like Darwin. You'd be in your room reading a book or something like that, and then the siren would go off. You'd run to the chopper, take the covers off, get the aircraft prepared while the pilots went to the briefing. They were briefed on where the contact is and what to do and everything like that. Then they would come to the chopper, you start the chopper up, and everybody would take off in formation. You'd fly to the contact area. The K car would go up, and the commander would tell G car that, drop your troops off there. G car two, drop your troops off there. G car three, drop your troops off there. G car four, drop your troops off there. And then he would command the troops on the ground from the top to get them to where the contact area is. And if the 20 mil sees any movement or anything of the hostility, then he would shoot into that area. And of course the G cars would just circle a wider thing in case they had to pick up troops or do a Kazovac or something like that. And then you'd say two would go and refuel. When they refueled, they'd come back and then two others would go and refuel. So that you've always got ground uh, air support in that area during the contact. How many such contacts can you have in those seven hours that you fly a day? Well, it depends on where they, if the, the Salute Scouts pick up the tours say at a place and you would go in to um, get a contact with the tours and with the troops <clears throat> you can maybe have two contacts in a day or some days you'd have three or four other days you won't have any for maybe a week or two and then all of a sudden it's just hell to fire and everybody's in <clears throat> I often wondered about your people because if you come in to pick up troops, how do you know you're not walking into an ambush or flying? Oh, that, happen an ambush? that happens. No, it happens. No, it's happened quite a few times. Not personally with me, only once with me that was up in Angola, but that was in a Puma, with a Puma. But <clears throat> luckily, we didn't get severely damaged or anybody got hurt or anything like that, but they had a few shots through the aircraft and other people have been killed doing the coming in to pick up troops and get shot in the aircraft. 
Uh, okay. Another of my radiation friends were killed in the uh, contacts, flight engineers, pilots, and that. Mm. There's no armor on this, Alouette. Pardon? There's no armor on it. It's not The armor pilot seat has got armored, um, armored plating. And you normally got an armored vest that you used to sit on on your chair and what have you. To, but otherwise, there's no armored plating anywhere else. Yeah. There's two things I want to ask you. And I ask this of all the flight engineers. The free two battalion people always say to me that when you came in to resupply or to drop people or pick people up, you would always kick out some something nice, a beer or a, a cold beer or something. Yeah. Where did that start? Was that pre-arranged or was that just between the guys, you know, we let's help these guys by by working hard? Yeah, it's between us and the guys. You mean when you're back at base and you get drink with them and you become friends. So <clears throat> when he's out in the felt for a month or something like that, and you always take them out some something nice, yeah, or um snook, if you get some snook in the mess, you know, voice or something like that, always take it out to them so that yeah, I know it's Now, the, I know the Rickies, as well as uh, the Salyu Scouts, sort of look like the enemy. I mean, by design, they, they try to blend in. Um, so how would you feel if you come in to land to pick these people up and you see these almost tank terrorists or something bombs at you? Well, that the pilot gets at the briefing before we go on the trip. So he he tells you that you, you're going to pick up people dressed just like terrorists and what have you. So don't get alarmed or shocked or anything like that. And they got to throw smoke so that we know that's the people that we're picking up. It's either green smoke or yellow smoke or red smoke. So that's how we identify that it is the right people that we are picking up when they throw the smoke. And if they throw the wrong color, what do you do? You don't go in, you speak to them on the radio and say, Why well, have you thrown that smoke and that smoke? And then they'll come back and say, Okay, they'd run out of red smoke, so that's why they've thrown yellow smoke. But they were briefed in the briefing that we would get red smoke. And so you speak to the guy on the ground that, that's the operator that you're picking up, you've got contact with him. Some of the pilots were telling me about Sam Sevens coming at them. Um, I'm sure you've, you've experienced that as well. Can you tell us about the Sam 7 and how you would dodge it, how you would defeat it? Well, if you're lucky enough to see it or somebody warned you, you do an automatic bank to one side as fast as possible. That's the only way you can divert from it because it cannot turn at 90 degrees at the speed it's going. <clears throat> but there has been a few contacts when people have seen Sam Sevens flying past and what have you, and you do your evasive actions to get away from it. Okay, when the helicopter banks like that, what's the chances of you falling out on the other side? No, no, you, the G-force keeps you in your chair. <laughs> you can even sit in the doorway. That's why the parabats and that always used to sit in the doorways of the pumas and that when we used to go out to contacts so that they can be disembark quick and what have you. But no, they won't fall out. It's the uh, G-force keeps you in. Unless you push the rudder the wrong way and <laughs> there's a negative force on them, no, then they'll fall out. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about that. I mean, that's one of the most enduring things of the war, I, I believe, is seeing those pumas with a back sitting with their legs sticking out. And, yes. uh, then, of course, they de they get out of that airframe very, very quickly as well. All units, uh, even yeah. us in the police, we did it too. And may I say that these people, these flight engineers, they had no sense of humor about that. They just showed, get out, and you don't, <laughs> even if you're 10 feet in the air. Um, I suppose a pilot will tell you uh, where these people jump. 
Yeah, well, you, you as an engineer, you can also define the height that the guys are jumping out at. So you won't let him jump from 100 foot or something like that. It'd be reasonable low, you know. <laughs> but a lot of times there's small bushes and what have you, so you let them jump out. But they used to that. They, they trained to do that. It was when you do OCCs with the bats and 3-2 battalion and that, that's an operational conversion course for new pilots and that, then they, that's all part of the training is to, to hover and let the troops jump out or um, with a um, uh, app sailing with a rope on the side at the app sail down to the ground. And then there's fast extraction with a long rope with a chair at the bottom that they climb into that you pull them out. Now they all train, that all gets trained before they ever go up to the bush and to contact areas and all that sort of thing. So a lot of training was going in before they even were posted to go up to the bush and what have you. Well, the staff didn't add enough aircraft. I think we can we can admit that. So you people would do whatever you can to bring that aircraft home. Of course, yeah. No, definitely. <clears throat> There were circumstances where it was impossible, but then um, it just gets burnt out over there and then dug a big hole and buried. It's just one of those things that was impossible to bring the aircraft back again. Were you people getting on their instructions to destroy your airframe if, if it should? Uh go down and it cannot be recovered? No, we didn't have any means of blowing it up or anything like that. They would send a special team out to do that. We, we as crew would never have any dynamite or anything like that to blow up an aircraft if we were shot down or anything like that. No, <clears throat> no they'd send a special task force out to go and do something like that. Or oh, they'll send a recovery team to recover the aircraft and bring it back, which has happened quite often. You'd go and cargo sling an alouette with the Puma back to base, and then they would fix it up there again. And <clears throat> well, I've seen pictures from uh, with a Super Freelon actually dragging the uh, alouette. Yes, yes. Did you ever work on the Super Freelon? I worked a little bit just while we were waiting for the Pumas to come into the country. But that was just a couple of months. It was nothing that I can say was really. <laughs> Does it take a different kind of man to work on these different helicopters in Outlook, or is it doesn't really matter? It flies. No, look, you do. You got to do it. Um, like on the Alouette, you got to do your courses and all that because the Alouette and the Puma. The way they do the rigging and all that sort of stuff is totally different. So you've got to have the training to do that on the Alouette, and you've got to have the training to do the same thing on a Puma or Oryx. <clears throat> it's you get your training while when you post it to that squadron. So you, and you do written courses and all that. Okay, let me let me ask a question to you differently. With the gunship type of crew, gunship type of pilot, volunteer for that type of thing instead of just doing a, you know, the, the rest like a like a Puma. Does it take a special kind of man to to be a gunship pilot and flight engineer? I wouldn't say so. I think it just depends on your personal feelings. If you want to, you know. There's a lot of people that, pilots that couldn't fly the uh, helicopter because they didn't have their coordination with the rudder pedals and the collective. Because when you pull the collective, you've got to change the rudder pedals because that's your anti-torque on the tail rotor. And a lot of people couldn't do that as pilots. But flight engineers, they would um, come, but once they had their first contact or something like that, then you'd say, no, this is not for me then he would go back to the ground. As a ground crew, he would stop flying then. <clears throat> I think it's just personal feeling for each person if they prepare to do it or not. 
Before I forget, I have to ask you this question, which I'll ask Steve and the rest as well. I want to know about the smell of special forces when they come out of a bush. <laughs> yeah, you can smell when a person hasn't bathed for two weeks <laughs> or a month or two months. <laughs> but then you open the windows and you open the, in the puma, you open the cargo floor door and the wind blows through there. So you don't get that smell coming through the front of the cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't mean it against special forces at all. I'm just, you know, I can just imagine because in the movies you don't smell things, you know, you see these rockets, yes, yeah. but you don't realize there's a smell attached to these guys. <laughs> yeah. Have you people ever dropped the special forces guys from the Pumas with um, parachutes? Yeah. Not in combat though, just yeah, in training and that. And there, Duka Duka, we used to do a lot of um, training with the recce's there. And we often used to take them up to do paratrooping. But in the, in the um, up in the border up there in the contact areas and that, you never drop parachutes out of the Puma and that over the contact area and that. <clears throat> that was all done by the Dakotas and the C1s and the C160s. <clears throat> So yeah, we used to go in to... land and drop the troops off. It's all abseiling. So were you doing this abseiling operationally as well? Yes. And on buildings and that in the in Pretoria when they had that, you know, they'd have like a mock-up saying that there's somebody being hostage and what have you, then you'd fly them in and also the police also abseiling them into buildings and stuff like that. Uh, it's just part of the training. So what would your role be as a flight engineer during these rescue operations where you fast rope these people down? You've got to talk the pilot over to the area. You've got to tell him to stop moving forward or stop moving left, go right to a steady, steady stop, and you'd patter him all the time until the, and then you'd say the guy's halfway down the rope, Okay, he's touching the ground, he's touching the ground, he's touching now. And then you say, I'm releasing the rope, I'm releasing the rope, I released it now. You clear it forward, clear to, to um, start getting altitude. So you'd patter him the whole time over the, the site where you're dropping the people off because sometimes it's on a small roof of a building or something like that, and he can't see where they are. So you're telling him exactly where they are and how how far they are down the rope and things like that. So you actually, his eyes through your mouth telling him what to do. Like with the solo building, when we rescued those people and it was on fire, we had to sort of fly and be in between aerials on top of the buildings because the hoist wasn't long enough to get right down to where the people were that were on the balcony. So we had to be as low as what we could in the build on the side of the building in between the aerials and that so you're patterning the pilot the whole time until the guys are in the strop and that and you can bring them up again yeah, so, but we, if you do bring them up you, you can't just accelerate the way you have to gently no no then you gently move backwards and then start climbing out and that because you can't just go up because there's obstacles above you and everything like that <clears throat> Now, what is that to do on the ocean if you try to rescue somebody from a boat or a ship like the Oceanos? Yeah, well, I was called out on that um, Helderberg when the Helderberg went down. And um, we did a lot of rescues from boats that had picked up parts of the aircraft and what have you. <clears throat> and the one lady's torso that uh, pulled out of the sea and that, then you talk the pilot the whole time over the boat while you're hoisting down because you're not allowed to land on the boat because it's like landing on another country and you all that so you can only hoist down and they hook everything onto the hoist and then hoist it up <clears throat> but you're also talking to the pilot the whole time patterning him where are we and how and move forward or move back or move left move right the same as when you're landing on a ship then 
Antarctica. I was also there for three months. And there we did a lot of landing on ships and that. And you got to go by the guy on the boat showing you where to land and everything like that. But you're also pattering the pilot most of the time. Seems to me there's a lot of trust between the pilot and the flight engineer. There has to be. There has to be. Especially when you're doing NBG ops, night flying with no lights, anything like that. You're just on NBG goggles. Then you pattering the pilot because he can't see the instruments because he's on NBG goggles and you can't look at the instruments because everything is blurred. So he's looking outside and you telling him how high he is, how fast he is, rate of descent, rate of climb. So you pattering him the whole time while he's in flight <clears throat> until you come into a hover. Then I go to the back, put on NBGs, and then the co-pilot will patter the pilot, and you'll tell the pilot that to go down, and or we're hoisting with the NBGs, and you tell the pilot the whole time what's happening, and the co-pilot is on instruments to give him his attitude and height and all that sort of stuff. I've heard somewhere that um, there's some kind of a scientific thing when a helicopter comes in to land to come down that it can be almost socked to the ground. I, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, some well, they call it um, vortex. It's when your air comes from the ground and goes over onto your blades again, then you've got no lift. And that's when you get vortex and you just fall into the ground. <clears throat> it's also if you forward speed and You've got no lift, you also can get vortex. So you mustn't descend and be at a fast forward speed. Now I find this fascinating because does the helicopter actually have the power to lift itself out of this vortex? Or if once it reaches it, it's going down? Well, it depends on how high you are from the ground. Because if you're close to the ground, it just sucks you into the ground, which has happened before. And there's nothing you can do. You can pull power as much as you like, and you just fall into the ground. It's, and it's like a hard landing, <laughs> a very hard landing. <laughs> okay, but the struts and the wheels will take the, the shock of this. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That should, yeah. <clears throat> will it help at that stage to, to tell the guys on board to jump to make it lighter? No, it happens. So quickly. No, it happened so quickly. There was, there's no time. Not even time. Most of the pilots can react to it if they get vortex. It's, it happened so quickly. It's, it's, um, I know that the coalition forces in Afghanistan before they ran away lost 400 airframes, mostly helicopters, and mostly because they had dust outs or brown outs. They couldn't they lost the horizon, so they would flip them. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not aware of that happening in the SAF a lot, if ever. Uh, can you tell me about this type of thing when you land and suddenly it just becomes brown in front of you with the sand? Well, flying up in Antarctica when there's a snowstorm, it's like flying inside a tennis ball. You cannot imagine... You can, it's just white outside. So you totally rely on your instruments, your artificial horizon, your descent and climb. And so you're pattering the pilot the whole time on the artificial horizon. You're banking right five degrees. You level, level flight now. You're climbing at 200 foot per minute. Okay, you're descending at 200 foot per minute. So you're telling him the whole time until you get out to, to see you, then, then it's open. And you can see the boat, so you can go and land on the boat because you couldn't land back at um, Goch where we stayed because um, there was no ways we could go in to land there because you don't know how, uh, the height or mountains in front of you or anything like that. So you climb to a height, safe height that's on the, the maps, and then you just fly straight out into sea until you can see where the boat is because normally the boat goes out and waits for you there. <clears throat> Those are not specialist pilots. These are regular squadron people who just volunteer to go to Antarctica. 
No, they all had training and that. You go through a psychological tests and everything like that before you go and what have you <clears throat> but all the pilots are specialized so it doesn't matter that you know you, you don't get an unspecialized pilot they're all trained to do their flights and do proper flights and everything like that that's a <clears throat> well yeah i'm tempted to say that the south air crew ground crew too very high standards mm. No, the SAF was very, very high standard at that. Now, I think it was Steve who said he became a marathon runner. Just for in case he shot down and he had to run all the way back. It must have entered your people's minds that you can be shot down. And the helicopters in, in this context never flew where the enemy were not. You were mostly, when you got called out, it's because the enemy was found. And you're in a supporting role. Yes. Did you people ever discuss this in, in what to do if should you go down and you survive and now you need to be on the road? Well, you get briefed before you got take off that if you do get shot down or anything like that, <clears throat> then you would head south for so many things and then you would turn east and you'd have a rendezvous point if you split up and then you'd always like you do survival courses and in that survival course they teach you should you go down or be shot down then this is what you'd have to do and all that <clears throat> and the recce's used to give us a survival course so you were quite um well trained to if you did get out and you were alive to try and survive because you did it at palabalba they had a nice um, training ground there <clears throat> that we used to do survival courses. Can you tell me about the survival course? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd get there and they'd welcome you and everything like that. And they say, okay, everybody just put on your flying overall and they load you in the back of a Bedford. And they'd ride along the road and they say, okay, one guy get out and make sure you got nothing on you. No matches, no nothing, no lighter, no cigarettes, nothing. And then they'll drop you off and then ride another kilometer, drop somebody else off, another kilometer, drop somebody else off. And then you'd wait and wait and wait and wait. And then next morning, you had the bed fit coming down the road and they'd pick you up. So you'd slept out in the bush that night for, with just your flying overall and nothing else. And then they'd um, give you an egg, a raw egg, and they'd drop you off. They'd say, when we come pick you up tomorrow morning, we want the egg to be boiled. You got no water, you got nothing, nothing with you. So a lot of people, a boy would come down the road and they would ask him to bring them some water and they'd sort of jip out that way. And then it found out, no, you got to dig a hole, put a whole lot of leaves around the egg and cover it with ground again and then make a fire on top of it so that the moisture from the leaves and that actually cooks the egg, <laughs> become a boiled egg. <laughs> uh, they'd give you one match and they say, if you use that one match, then you bug it. So you got a match, but you haven't got any pot of water to boil the egg in. <laughs> but then it came out, that's how you do it. So. But that, I think, was very necessary. I mean, this was, this can save your life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what they used to do is they used to drop you off and then say, okay, you've got to walk to that mountain over there. But then on the way to that mountain, there would be, the Rickies would have ambushes. And if they caught you, then they throw you full of condensed milk, roll you in the sand and the mud and what have you. And that's how you had to live for the next two weeks. <laughs> But then you'd bypass them. You'd only walk at night. You didn't walk during the day because they got OP points on top of the mountains and then they check you and then they send the other recce's in to go and catch you. So you walk at night until you get to your OP point and then now that you get a box of rat packs and that'll give you a letter saying you must go to that next place over there. So you go to the next OP place and then from there until you got back to camp. <clears throat> yeah, so... He, there would be a pilot, two pilots and two engineers in a team. 
and that's that team had to get from that rendezvous point to that rendezvous point to that rendezvous point till they made it back to camp, hoping that the Rekis don't catch you on the way, because then they torture you with that shock machine and. As I say, throw you full of condensed milk and roll <laughs> Do you have a yeah, variety to defend yourself? Ways of... Pardon? Do you have a variety to defend yourself? I mean, if these wreckies catch you, I mean, can you beat them back or do something with them? No, they want you to talk and tell you where the next rendezvous point is and that so that they can catch the other people if they only caught one. Because sometimes you split up. And then you split up so that if they do catch, they only catch one, they don't catch the whole lot of you. Then you have different rendezvous points where you um, come together and then make plans and then sleep in the bush during the day. And then at night, you walk together again. Okay, but that, the Special Forces guys for Rekis are not your only enemy there. I mean, there's wild animals who can bite you. Oh, yeah, there's hyenas. All sorts of wild animals. There was one pilot that was also bitten by a hyena while he was sleeping. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's passed away. May I ask what happened to this pilot? Because I, I heard the rumor that it, the hyena got him in the ass. It, it grabbed him on the buttocks. Yeah, it bit him on the head, yeah. But he got away from it. So. Yeah, he got away from it there. But he was lucky. <laughs> you have no firearm with you. It's not that you can defend yourself against these animals. No, not on the survival course. No. No, you got nothing. As I say, it's just your flying overall. That's all. Nothing else. <clears throat> That's where you learn to eat off the bush and everything like that because you got no food with you or anything. And then when you're back at base, um, they give you a tin, one tin. This group, one tin, that group, one tin, that group. So you'll end up with a tin of peas. The other guy will end up with a tin of um, baked beans. The other guy will end up with a tin with meat and all that in it. And then they would see if you come together and sort of mix it all up, or you're just going to eat, your group's just going to eat your green peas. <laughs> and things like that. And then they'd take you into a room with a whole lot of stuff lying around, say like a magazine and a binoculars and a, a knife and glasses and binoculars and all that. And they give you 10 seconds to go in and then you've got to come out and you've got to identify all the objects that you saw in that room in that 10 seconds. And tests like that they would do with you in the courses. It's very interesting when you do the survival course. They teach you what to eat off the ground and all that sort of stuff. Like Kaki boss, you can make spinach out of it it's, and eat it. <laughs> so there's no need for you actually to go hungry. If you if you if you trained well enough, you can you can eat well. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, there's different various kinds of roots that you can eat, and there's a lot of berries and stuff that you can eat that they show you show you how to test it and what to test and all that sort of stuff. How to make a snare to catch a rat or a rabbit or something like that. So that's what's so interesting about the survival courses, everything they teach you there. Does it happen often, the survival course, or do you only do it once? I did three in my time that I was... Because <clears throat> they... they Sometimes they had different grades that you could do. You do a sea survival course as well, where they teach you if you dumped into the sea how to open up the dinghy and all that sort of stuff and how to survive in the sea. And how would that go? In, in a harbor or out in the open sea? No, out in the open sea. <laughs> Get all your initial training in the swimming pool and then, then they put dump you out at sea with a dinghy and then they come and hoist you out with a puma or an alouette or something like that but you stay in the dinghy and sometimes you can stay overnight in the dinghy as well so. I suppose that's where you find out how big the ocean really is it is yeah <laughs> 
this thing can't sail around. I mean, it can keep you adrift or afloat, but you, you can't put the sail yeah, on. You, you get a net that you can throw into the current and the current will pull you along in a certain direction and all that, but you've got to know which current to take because if you take a current to go out to sea, <laughs> that's not good. You want to get the current that brings you into land. <laughs> But how would, so you know you that? That. Huh? how would you know that? How would Just you know which current you want? If you throw it out that side of the boat and the current brings it around to that side of the boat, then you know you're going in that direction. So <laughs> that's not the direction you want to go. So you pull it back in. <laughs> I have a question for you. It's a bit technical, but perhaps you can you can tell me. Uh, I recall when I was in Nigeria, there was a Puma which actually was supplying the oil rigs. And this thing had to land in the water and then it had some floats which came up by itself. Yes. It could float around, but it was still ruined. I mean, they, they got it back, uh, but they were just shaking their heads. They said they couldn't, they, well, I think they, 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 wrote, they wrote it off. Are these float things, are they standard on the Puma or do you have to put it on uh, before you go out? Now, if you're flying overseas doing sea ops, you know, rescue on boats and stuff like that, then most of the coastal um, squadrons have got them already put onto the Puma. But you can take it off and put it on. But when you're at the coast, they normally all the helicopters on that squadron are got flotation gear fitted. <clears throat> but inland over here, and that we never had um, flotation gear and fitted in that. Like when we did the Alderberg rescue and that the pumas that, that we took from SWAT Corps, we loaded into two C-160s, flew to um, Mauritius, and then we assembled them there through the night and the next morning we took off, but we didn't have flotation gear on those. But then when the, the Cape Town people came up to relieve us, they had brought pumas that had flotation gear on because they came up with a boat. So now they, I was reading the newspaper on a Sunday afternoon at three o'clock when I got a phone call to say that I must come to the squadron immediately and start assembling two pumas to load into two C-160s to take off the next morning at six o'clock to go to Mauritius for the Alderberg. And I was reading the newspaper, said to my wife, hey, the airplane's crashed. And just then, and then I said, I'm going to Mauritius. <laughs> yeah. Well, as long as you were not going to Seychelles, because there was a bit of a problem with my court and his Mary men and Seychelles. We yeah. Welcome, but Mauritius, beautiful place. How were you yeah. treated there? Were you, were you welcomed, even in the Very tragedy? much so. Very much so. We stayed in the Saint La Cruz Hotel. And and everything was paid for. SAA paid for everything. And um, no, it was, we were well treated, very well treated. There might be some people here, Kenny, we don't know what happened to the elder book. I wonder if you can just briefly tell them, perhaps. Well, there's so many rumors going around, but we really didn't pick up any evidence of anything with all the stuff that we brought up and took to the harbor because they they took it to Fort Chepston and they laid everything out on the hangar floor over there and what have you. But we never got any information what had happened or anything like that except what we read and gone on Google and what have you. But there at Mauritius, nothing was ever said to us. Well, that's an important point here because there are also rumors that your people did see something and you were sworn to silence. So that's not true. No, no. Yeah, the other bit, it was a 747, I think, which went down. Yeah, it does that no really knows what happened there. Lots of rumors. Everybody died. Lots of rumors, yeah. yeah. Were you on that helicopter which lost its, um, its ladder? No, not on that one, no. no. I was on the ops in Angola when we picked up a vibration of the tail rotor rudder. 
And all of a sudden, the whole cockpit just went red. And I thought somebody, one of the tubes had run into the tail rotor. So I cut the engines and I got out. And Ziggy, which is in helicopter next to us, now the Alouettes are flying, shooting, and having a big contact. <clears throat> and um, he lands and he just takes photos of us and they take off and leave us in a contact. <laughs> what had happened? One of the tail rotor blades, the that holds the stack of bearings, the nut had come loose and that whole blade had come off, which caused the hell of a vibration and broke the whole tail gearbox off the thing. And the 32 battalion troops that we had dropped off, they came walking back with the tail rotor blade over their shoulder that didn't have a scratch on it. <laughs> so that had come off. And then we had to fly another tail boom in. We put it through the two doors of the Puma and they flew the tail boom in. We made a special pole and that to fit the new um, tail boom. And then we started up after we'd done everything and Lopis pushed the rudders and there was no rudder. And then we found out the bell crank under the floor had snapped, broken. So we had to take the window out and had to fly us another bell crank in from Ondongwa, install that. And then we took off and flew back to Ondongwa with a broken tail boom through the other, <laughs> other Puma's door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm shaking my head. That, that's magic. That's magic. So it wasn't the troop which which actually walked into the. Uh, no, no, no. That, that's the bolt that the nut that holds the stack bearings had come undone, and so that whole stack bearing, the whole thing holding the tail rope that came off, while it was spinning. Luckily, we just just touched down on ground. Otherwise, we would have been doing 360s through the bush. <clears throat> Yeah, you would have probably died. Now, <laughs> now I need to ask another technical question. When you have a damaged helicopter like that, is it better to fly close to the ground so you don't fall too far? Or is it better to go high and you have time to make a plan if, if something goes wrong? No, no, you got to ground as quick as possible. Dump power and go to ground because the more power you've got on the tail rotor, the more torque you need. So you dump so that there's no, not much that talk on the thing and try and keep forward flight. <clears throat> that happened in the Soweto rights um, many, many years ago. We were sent to the Nella to go and they were, we were throwing smoke grenade, uh, tear gas and that out and everything like that. But at that stage, we were also low in that. And then we went back to Rand Airport to refuel. <clears throat> and on the way back to the scene, we also picked up a hell of a vibration on the tail rotor and we landed. And you could see clearly where a brick had um, hit the tail rotor. They must have thrown us with a half brick or something and hit the tail rotor and it cracked there and that piece broke off the tail rotor. And that also caused a hell of a vibration. So we also had to land between Rand and Soweto in the field. And then a Freelon brought us another tail boom and gearbox and stuff and we put it onto the LOA. Would this be done by you yourself in the field? Yeah, you help. You help with the ground crew and that to do everything. Yeah. No, I've heard yeah. that the flight engineers could sort of fly a helicopter as well in a real emergency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but often. Yeah, I'm listening. Often. In Angola, when you used to do trooping, then the pilot used to fly with the troops to the drop-off area, and then he would let you fly back. <clears throat> then he'd put his hand around the cyclic like that and say, every time you touch my fingers, you've got to go get me a beer. <laughs> so you've got to hold the stick still, you know. It's not big movements and that. So the smaller movements you do, the, the less the chopper messes around and that. And also when we used to do test flights at Danel, then the, you'd just be the pilot and flight engineer. And then the pilot would also let you fly the Puma to Danel and then help you land there and what have you. So we used to do a lot of flying with the pilot. Especially when we were so short, the pilots at engineer. They were all up in the bush and then there wasn't so many pilots back here. My question now is, can the pilot do what the flight engineer does? Um, to a certain extent. You won't be able to like change major components and stuff like that. But to do a normal 
five hours servicing with a grease gun and that he would be able to do that but um as i say with major components and that they they won't be able to do that because they haven't um, done the training to do that sort of thing <clears throat> who washes this aircraft yeah no you you clean your aircraft every time you come back from an ops and that it's that's your proud and joy i mean you're not going to see if the thing's full of dust and dirty and full of grease and everything like that and there's a is a, a bolt coming loose or something like that you won't pick it up but if you clean the chopper properly and that you'll see where there's something going wrong and a crack or something in the skin or something like that that you'll pick up but if you don't clean it then you're not going to see that i've seen the the nato helicopters where they transport wounded uh, soldiers they have like a sail carpet type of thing inside I suppose to protect the aircraft from blood, which is corrosive. I've never seen that in a SAF helicopter. Did that come later, or were you people just not bothered about it? No, well, in the beginning, you only put the dead people in body bags, but other people will always be on a stretcher, which is normally lined with a sheet or something that once the medics have you know bandaged them up and what have you and then you put the stretch in the chopper but if a dead body and all that is normally put in a body bag those plastic body bags but often you do get blood on the floors and everything like that and when you land back at base and the medics have to come and get that special solvent to clean it and everything like that because it's quite corrosive blood and stuff have you ever had an incident where uh, the troops refused to jump out of a helicopter when told to no not that i can recall that that alpha project you were working on in the nell is that we were way for came out of yeah that uh, that we did at csr with paul portrita he was the doctor in charge and then after that they proved to the air force that they could build a gunship by turning the alouette into a gunship with a 20 mil on the nose and all that and then that's when the roy falk project started but i felt that the roy falk is actually quite closer to the puma as what it would be to alouette now the Roy Fox got a totally different transmission system to the, the Puma and the Oryx and the Alouette. <clears throat> and the cockpit is totally different. The, the, um, the transmission gearbox, tail gearbox, tail rider blades, main rider blades, and all that is ex exactly the same as the Oryx. But you got a, in, um, a two intermediate gearboxes because the engines are back to front so that the engines are feeding into the gearbox and the gearbox are feeding back into the main gearbox <clears throat> why did they design it like that to keep it narrow <clears throat> so have you ever actually worked on the way fork itself yeah uh, i was the main mechanic on the roy fork when the first two were built Myself and Gus Anderman, we were the two mechanics on the prototype in the hangar at um, the proto shop at the Nell. We did all the engine installation, the gearbox installations. Um, Jake Jacobs was also one of the chief technicians that was working with us. <clears throat> you would install the tail boom, you would help rivet when there wasn't any mechanical things. <clears throat> No, it was a good learning curve. Learned a lot of sheet metal work stuff and all that on the Roy Falk. Also on the Alpha. Because there, the Alpha, it was just me as a mechanic there. The other guys were from CSR. They were composite engineers and all that that did the cockpit for the Alpha. But the Alouette's installation and all that, that was all my, my had to do. I am putting together a, an episode where we're going to speak to different people on what would have happened 
if the war didn't end. Now, of course, it's fiction. The war did end. We know it. Yeah. But do you think the Ray Falk would have done well in Angola? Definitely. It's doing so well in the DRC. The people are very, very happy with it in the DRC. And I think the DRC is obviously close to what we would have had in Angola. <clears throat> yeah, they're very, very happy with the performance of the Roy Falk in the DRC. Yes, I've heard the rumors, actually. I read the reports. I believe the two Roy Falk went in where some Ukrainian concepts refused or something like that. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard the story. Perhaps you know it better than me. No, I haven't. No, I don't know anything about that. I haven't heard anything. <clears throat> yeah, apparently they were attacking something and uh, the Roy Falk who were not supposed to go in before these people went in first. And then they sort of developed pro some kind of technical issues which no one believes. <laughs> the, the Roy Falk went, <laughs> went in and they did absolutely everything expected of them. They actually did very, very well. Yes, that's what I've heard, yeah. <clears throat> but I didn't know there was a that the other people had just um, picked up snacks not to go in. I didn't know that. But I've just heard that the Roy Fox has been doing very well up there. Well, it should. It should. I mean, it is a very practical design. Well, it was designed to do that, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially that they were not sold more. I mean, that was just political interference otherwise i mean they were they were leading most of it this in the uk yes. right and then america forced them to buy the apache exactly how powerful is this roy fox engines in fin air it's very powerful because they landed in the mountains there in dubai and those places where the apache in that couldn't land so and it, that's one of the tests that they did up there. Yeah, that's very true, because I've also heard that um, the British Apache could fly in Afghanistan with his mast attached to it, because it had different engines, it was powerful enough. Mm. But the American version couldn't. They had to take yeah. this mast off, because he just didn't have the power to, to, do any, to, to fly with it. Yeah. So let us talk about the MI-24. Um, that's where your people worked on a Soviet type of helicopter. That must have been weird. Yeah, it is a Russian helicopter. Pardon? I say that must have been weird for you to yeah, see an enemy helicopter to work on. Not really. It was... Um... All helicopters are basic, same sort of thing. And what was different on this one was the anti-icing that they had on the main rotor blades and how they did it through the shaft in the gearbox. <clears throat> that was totally mind-boggling to me. And um, But otherwise, it's very, very, very complicated design. The, It'll take you about a day just to change the engine, whereas with the Puma and the RX, it takes you 20 minutes. <laughs> and it's very complicated, the way they designed the engines and all that. But the gearbox, you've got to take the engines off to get the gearbox off and all that sort of stuff. Whereas a Puma, you can just slide the engines forward and take the gearbox off. So... Um, it was a good experience working on them. But they're also clumbers at <laughs> heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. <laughs> they're very, very strong, built strong. Yeah. Yeah, they said they are soldier proof, you know, they, they really are. Now I've got a question for you, Kenny, if you don't mind. I've heard that the SAF had very good dust filters for helicopters. Uh, quite different from what would be, say, in France. Is, is that true? It's all worked on the Vortex system. 
we um, designed the sand filter also for the MI24s, also exactly the same principle as the Puma and the RX. It's just vortexes that were made by CSIR that you install in a place that circulates the air and the, the, the um, what do you call it now? The G-force throws the dust particles to the one side and it's got an electric fan that sucks that out. So the vortex just spins the air and the centrifugal force, that's what I was looking for, throws the dust particles out and that gets sucked out by the fan. So that doesn't go into the engine. Wow, that's clever. And that's a South African design. Yeah, it's, I don't know where it was designed, but the, <clears throat> the British company that we got to build the sand filters, they, they that used the same principle as what the Roy Falk and the Puma and the RX sand filters work. After all these years of working with helicopters, do you feel some excitement when you hear those engines starting up? No, definitely, especially with these rebuilds that I'm doing now. Yeah, you just can't wait to hear the engine going and to see it take off and that. Because, you know, they totally stripped every bolt, nut and washer is taken off and you put everything back together again. <clears throat> now, it's a great feeling when you see it take off and fly and come back and then there's hardly any snags or something like that. Yeah. Now, I know it's your 54th um, marriage, what do you call the word in English? Ardenka. Yeah. Yeah, well, so, I, so I just have one last question before your wife gets angry with me. <laughs> um, is there any incident which you can recall in your life, which you can tell us, which you think was outstanding? Okay, I mentioned the silo building that was burning and then there was a Hrabi's waterfall an army guy fell from the top to the bottom and he survived and um, we were called out at three o'clock to fly to Hrabi's three o'clock that afternoon <clears throat> and we got there when it was pitch dark and they'd made a fire at the bottom so we had to drop the hoist down to the bottom but as soon as we went low enough for the cable to reach the people, then the sparks from the fire would start flying into the people that were helping the guy at the bottom. So eventually I said to Polly, must go up higher. And then I asked the nurse, she must just hold the eldest lamp out. That's a lamp that shines. Hold it outside the door so that I can see where the stretcher and that's going down to and what have you. And she was <laughs> shining the light in the air and all over the place except where I wanted it to, because she was too scared to put her face out the door to look at the bottom. But we eventually got him into the stretcher and pulled him up. And then we um, took over, went over to the side, landed, put the guy into the stretcher, and we took him through to the Uppington Hospital. And he survived. <clears throat> And then there's another funny story I want to tell you. you know, we, a, we did an ops in Angola and we came back and one of the flight engineers got one of these paraffin stoves. So we landed back at Yanana and he was fiddling around in the back because now the pilots were in the front seat and he was in the, because they're all on ready alert to be called out. <laughs> and he was fiddling with this gas stove in the back of the Puma and the pilot said to him, take that thing out just now you let he blow this puma up and what have you. So he took it out and he was underneath the puma's tail boom, fiddling with this gas stove, uh, this paraffin stove, and all of a sudden there was just one big explosion. <laughs> and he said when he looked up, they got the, the, the walls on the side all around the, the embankments. He said when he looked up through the dust and that, he was Hojan Kronia and Rossi Erasmus, they both big, big pilots, they were standing on the wall looking at Urchis to see what the hell was this explosion. In the meantime, the Puma's nose wheel had burst. <laughs> it was just waiting for the right time to happen. <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so it must have been the... bloody incidents. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't the paraffin stuff that blew. It was the front tire of the Puma. <laughs> Just for a matter of interest, how do you change those wheels? Is it like a car? You just jack it up and... Yeah, you just jack it up and undo one nut and then you slide the wheel off the axle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was fascinating to me. If you have any words of advice, for well, let's say a youngster who is watching here and he wants to join the Air Force, doesn't matter which one, I don't care, and he wants to become a flight engineer, but what would you tell him? I tell him to learn the chopper properly and really know exactly what the thing is all about before going out on a trip by yourself and all that. Learn how to do snags, how to fix snags, and how to do proper rigging. And don't take any shortcuts because shortcuts can cause you death. My advice is that you learn the helicopter properly before you become flight engineer. Well, folks, we've come to the end of this one. I'm sure that Kenny will be back. Um, if you have questions, please leave it here below. I know I spoke more than usual. Don't hate me for that. I was asking questions. I was excited. No, but no, not at all. Thank you for that, because uh, there are some people who will complain, but that's fine. We don't care, we fix skin by now. But the rest of you, I was just telling uh, Kenny here, uh, the gratefulness we feel towards the chopper crews, especially if your mate is bleeding and you were on the radio and these people would always come, always arrive, do a proper job. And then, you know what? I wish to thank all of you. It's fantastic. It's fantastic to meet you people. For us, we never... Um, that the experience with you people, that this is an eye-opener. Thank you for that. For the rest of us, if you have any story you want to come and tell me, please do so. Just contact me, and we will set up a meeting, and we will record your story, and hopefully a few years from now, some youngster will look at it, and you'll say, yeah, that was a whim for me as I want to be like I was. And that's how it works in life. You look at somebody where you want to follow. So I thank all of you. And thank you again, Kenny, all of you, and your wife for patience for bringing us this chocolate when I'm in South Africa to make up for this. Okay. And uh, God bless. Thank you very much. <laughs>